vacation and traveling around many different people this is the time of year where people go out and get a break and go to the beach or go to the mountains or or go somewhere and uh just keep the ones that are in prayer that's away today that's not with us but um i'm continuing in uh exodus i'm in exodus chapter 3 1 through 11 just kind of hitting some uh, different highlights in exodus and um Today we're going to be uh, talking about and sharing uh, where Moses was at the burning bush. And uh, if you're able to stand with me, stand with me as we read Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 11. Exodus chapter 3, 1 through 11. So. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert, and came to Horeb, the mountain, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and, and see this great sight, while the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take, off your, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel has come to me and I also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your word and your instructions. And Lord, I pray now that, Lord, you just clear our minds, clear our thoughts. And Lord, I pray that you will speak through your servant in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are with... Uh, with Moses, and uh, Moses is tending the sheep of his father, father-in-law Jethro, on the mountain of Haram, which is considered to be the mountain of God, where he encountered the angel of the Lord, the I Am. The angel of the Lord was a visible manifestation of God, possible, some say possible, the pre-incarnated Christ. The flame of fire was the glory of God's presence, the Shekinah, which transformed everything and everyone it touched. The power of God has the power to change everything and everyone that he touches. Well, in the past uh, week or so, we talked about Moses and his birth and him going through that in God's hand upon Moses during the time that he was put in a basket and set in the reeds and then Pharaoh's daughter found him and sent, the, um, sent one of his maids to get the, his mother to, to feed him, to breastfeed him. And then he grew up in the house in, in Egypt. Um, in chapter 2, it talks about him uh, had grown. And then, you know, the, the Hebrews was under severe persecution under severe persecution and he he sees one of the uh, Egyptians beating a Hebrew and Moses strikes the Egyptian and kills the Egyptian so he flees he flees and ends up in Midian to where we are now and he is being confronted and he has an encounter with a bush well he has an encounter with the Almighty God so a lot of things has taken place here. 
at the time of him Moses being born and then you know Moses doing something horribly wrong and then leaving and and then he finds a, a, a daughter of Jethro and uh, and then makes him a wife and and uh, now he's tending sheep in uh, that area of Midian and uh, then he has his encounter with the I am so that's kind of where we're at and the first point that I want to share with you today is that God's presence changes everything. Do you believe that? Amen. That God's presence changes everything. And I hope that you've experienced God's presence in your life each and every day. I hope that you're, uh, uh, you are striving to have God in your presence because we can have we can have other things in our presence too Satan can be in our presence to where it distorts everything that God has created but our goal is to have God's presence in our life because God's presence changes everything about us everything around us God even changes as we've looked at verses 1 through 5 that God changes the landscape by using a burning bush in the desert to grab Moses' attention. Something not normal was there. But I was reading and doing some research, but there is a plant that is in Asia and in the desert of Africa. It's called a Dictamus, and I, I'm probably messing this word up, Dictamus albus plant. What it does, it has all these oils in it. And you can literally, I pulled it up, you can pull it up online and look at somebody taking a lighter and lighting it, and it will consume, it will ignite. And it, it, it's not an ignition of like setting on fire, it, it is like you're lighting like, you know, you ever hit an aerosol spray, and you spray, and it throws out, it does that for a time and then goes out. And, um, but... He was looking at this particular, this bush, and some say it might have been this plant, but it was not consumed. It was burning, but not consumed, just sitting there burning. Usually when you set something on fire, folks, it burns to ashes and goes away, but he was experiencing something far different that got his attention, which was a burning bush that was burning, but it wasn't consumed. It was just burning. And didn't go out and didn't burn down. A lot of times if you're out in the desert and something's pretty dry and you set a match to it, it's going to burn and it's going to go out. But this was a, uh, a fire that was not consumed and was there burning. But that was not the big, that was not the big point of it. Yeah, that was kind of out of the ordinary. But the bush became a special and holy place when touched by God. The spontaneous combustion was not unusual in the desert, but a non-consuming flame was an extraordinary and an event that commanded attention. So it wasn't not unusual for something to kind of ignite with all that heat in the desert, especially with these particular uh, plants. They would ignite and then go out. But this was a consuming flame. This was a consuming fire. And ladies and gentlemen, the Lord can put a consuming fire in you. That cannot be extinguished. That cannot be put out. I hope you have that today, that consuming fire that God wants to put inside of you. And I hope it's burning and, and, and continues to burn through all the days of your life. But he is encountering this, this planet and just catches his attention. And as he's approaching this and he sees this and then what makes it so ordinary extraordinary you're looking at this consumable this plant that's being consumed but not burning out and then he hears a voice he turns away from it then God really grabs his attention by calling him by name by calling him by name as we see in verse 4 so when the Lord saw that he had turned aside and to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. It wasn't really a light. Moses, hey, Moses. It was Moses, Moses. Saw that he was turning away and he said, here I am. Moses says, here I am. 
Well, you think about too, uh, the Lord called out Isaiah. And what did Isaiah say? Here I am. Send me. So this was a start of God and Moses coming together in the experience. And we're going to go more into that later on next week too with their encounter. But God's presence changed ordinary ground. God's presence changed an ordinary bush. God's presence changed everything about that situation. It was just a desert. You think about a desert. There's really nothing in the desert, right? It's deserted. It's hot. There's nothing really special about it. It's just sand and maybe these plants. But God made it extraordinary and used it to call Moses, to get Moses' attention, to change things for Moses. The next thing that I want to share with you is that God identifies himself and his purpose. We see verse 6, he says, Moreover, I, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Because God is so holy. We live in a world and a nation that God is not holy no more. There's not a reverence, there's not a fear of God. God explains who he is. Maybe they Maybe God called him and you might think, well, he was hallucinating. I'm sure some people probably thought he was hallucinating out there in the desert. But God called him by name and God identified who he was that I am the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. God, the God that told Abraham that he was going to make his nation a great and mighty nation. Which was the nation of Israel. You see in verse 7 he says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of the people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. As we talked about a week or so, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it's been a little while about the the Pharaoh, and um, I had mentioned this last week. Pharaoh, and I learned something new that Pharaoh is the Egyptian king. So there was a different Pharaoh at the time of Joseph's time, and then Joseph, that Pharaoh died, and then a new Pharaoh, which did not have no ties with the Israelite, the Hebrew children. So he was threatened by what was taking place in that nation. He was threatened by the growth of the Hebrews and the growth of the Israelites to where he had to put a stop to it. So he started being brutal to the Israelites. Then it came to the point of last week where it's talking about he wanted to kill all the children that were born, the sons, he wanted to kill them all. He wanted to do away with them because they were a threat. They were a threat to his power. And I don't know if you remember last week I was talking about King Herod when Jesus stepped on the scene, that King Herod was a threat to him because people were talking about this new king, this son that had come and that was a king and it was a star and, and he wanted all of the kids that were under two years old to be killed. It was a threat. <laughs> But God emphasizes with and has empathy with Moses about God's people. He said, I was surely seeing the oppression. This is verse 7. I surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. And then after that, God shares his plan. He shares his plan. So I have come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land. And he's even talking about future events that is going to take place. Future events here. Bring them up from the land to the good and large land. You ever heard of the story about the land of milk and honey, the promised land? He's sharing this with Moses here. 
I wonder what Moses is, is thinking at this time where God is, he's having this encounter with God and God is sharing these plans with him. I don't know if Moses is having doubt or if he's, you know, that is a lot to take on. Because he even shares in 8, 9, and 10, he, he, um, he, in verse 8, he, God shares his plan for him and his people. And he also shares, he commissions Moses on what to do. He says, so in verse 8, he says, So I have come to deliver you out of the hand of Egyptians and bring them up from the land to good, to good and large land, to the land that flowing with milk and honey. What was that? What has that been referred to in the book of Numbers, the, the, the land that flows with milk and honey? What is that considered? The promised land. The promised land. To the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites. Parasites and the Hittites and the Jebusites, a lot of sites. Then in verse 9 and 10, he commissions him. He says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel have come to me. God knows what has taken place in Egypt, in Egypt. Has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Brutal. Because of their Population is a threat. Come therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Israel, out of Egypt. Now you think about this now. He is commissioning Moses to go to back to Egypt. I'm sure there's a lot of things going through Moses' mind. Because you know he he killed a he killed an Egyptian. Pharaoh found knew about it, and the God is commissioning him to go back to that place. As he talked about earlier in chapters, he's either in chapter uh, one, where it talks about that this new Pharaoh didn't have no ties to is, uh, the Israelites, the Hebrews which Hebrews, Israelites, didn't have no ties to them, didn't have no obligation to them. You know, Joseph in Genesis, he had, uh, he had, he had found favor and was put in a high authority in Egypt. That he's, he's died, he's gone. Then another, that Pharaoh, he passes. Then there's a new one. So Moses is being summoned to go back to a place that he ran from. Don't know what he's thinking about this, but God shares this and shares the commission that he has for Moses. And the two points that I want to make today, I know this is more of like a story, and it is a great big story, a great big love story of the biggest story for me and for you, is that God's presence changes everything. We see where God's presence changed the landscape there in the desert. He did something extraordinary with a bush. Ladies and gentlemen, he's planning to do something extraordinary with Moses. Do you believe that God can do something extraordinary in you? Do you believe that? This is the same God. We serve the same God that is back over thousands of years ago in this encounter with Moses. And if you know who Moses is, he was just an ordinary individual. All the people that God used in the Bible were just ordinary people just like me and you. God wants to use you for his glory and his worship. That's what we were created for, is to be used by God and to worship him. God's presence changes everything. God's presence in your life changes you, changes your life. And some of y'all have experienced that in your life of God changing you and continuing to change you. If you have not been coming to Sunday school, come to Sunday school. We were talking about today <clears throat> about the changes in life and the changes in relationships, the changes in uh, Barnabas' relationship with Paul. 
your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ should change from day to day, from year to year, to where it draws you closer to Him, to where in return He draws closer to you. And because the presence of God in your life, if you want the presence of God in your life, you need to commune with Him and read His Word and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. You need to pray and communicate with God and you need to fellowship with other believers to where you experience the presence of God. And I hope that you are experiencing that presence today because there's nothing like it. Moses was experiencing something unlike anything else. Even by looking at a bush. God's presence can change your family. God's presence can change your family. God's presence can change your marriage. God's presence can change your church. God's, God's presence can change your country. Amen. Problem is, is our country does not have God's presence. He's not present no more. Amen. He is removing his hands from this great United States of America. And we're seeing the repercussions of it every single day. And every single time we turn on social media or the TV or read the newspaper, we are seeing God's presence being removed from America. But God's presence changes everything. Even the landscape. Because God is holy. God told Moses, take your sandals off. You are on holy ground. There's no power, no holiness, and no reverence like God. In our culture and in our society and in the world, people worship rulers and men and politicians and uh, rock stars and uh, idols and all that, but they are nothing compared to the God Almighty because He is holy. The next thing that I want to share before I close, the next point is God is always working and He will always, He always has a plan. He always has a plan for you. Question is, is are you in His presence Today, Are you in his presence each and every day? Is he a part of your life? Or have you done like America and have removed his presence out of your life? Or pushed him out of your life? Only you can answer that question. God is seeking Moses here. He's got a plan for Moses. He even told him he had a plan for him. In 8, 9, and 10, he's got a plan for the Israelites that he's going to take them to the land of milk and honey. A great place. Sounds great, don't it? Ladies and gentlemen, he's got a plan for us to take us to the promised land, to give us eternal life, to give us abundant life here on earth. Yeah, we're going to have trials, we'll have troubles, but he's going to give us abundant life to where he's going to be walking with us through each and every situation here on earth. So the question is today is that are you in the presence of God? Is God in your presence? Are you allowing God to be in your presence? Are you allowing God to be in your life? Are you seeking to draw to Him so He can draw to you? And then His presence changes everything. It starts with you. And then it comes out of you to your spouse, and to your family, and to your friends, and to your co-workers, and to your church. God's presence changes everything, even down to a bush, folks. Even down to a bush. Have you ever seen a bush on fire and never go out? Some of y'all cut shrubs down. I've cut shrubs down. Put it in the fire pit. I got a fire pit outside my house. And I put it in there and I burn it. It eventually goes out. I'll have a campfire one night, sit around, have a good time talking about different things with a campfire. And sometimes it'll be burning, but then the next morning, what is it? It's gone. 
God's presence changed everything about the bush. It didn't go out. It stayed consumed. And that's what got his attention. But the biggest thing that got Moses' attention is the voice coming from there. Calling his name, Moses, Moses. Is, is God calling your name and what he wants you to do? Is he saying, Will, I'll use your example, Will, Will. Or is he saying, K, K. Or is he saying, Albert, Albert. Put your, put your name in that blank. Is he calling you to do something? Or is he calling you to just to come to him and repent of your sin and get saved because he's got something for you that's far greater than what you've experienced and what you've been putting before everything ups up until this point. I, I believe, I truly believe that right at that moment right there, well, I know that, that things changed for Moses right there at that point when he experienced God through that bush. Yeah, Moses had a lot of excuses, and we'll find out about that next coming weeks. He had a lot of excuses and a lot of things, but God worked through that too. God has a plan for you. It doesn't matter what kind of disabilities you have or what kind of uh, issues that you think you have or that you might not be good enough or you might not know all there is to know about the Bible or you just don't speak. At, and that's what Moses, and I, sometimes I can, I can identify with Moses because sometimes I get tongue-tied and can't speak eloquently. See, I had to say that slow. I can't say it fast. Eloquently. Even Moses said, I cannot speak eloquently. But what did Jesus, what did God do? Well, we'll find out about that later. But if you need to make a decision for Christ today, if he's trying to get your attention and he wants you to do something, surrender to him. Don't turn aside. See, he saw that burning bush and it won't consume you. There's something different about this bush. You turn aside and then, Moses, Moses. It's like, don't turn from me. Can't run from God, folks. Can't run from God. If there's a decision you need to make, make it. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If you need to just come down here and come to the altar, do business, or do business at your seat. If you know that God's calling you, or if He's calling you to become, to get saved, to, to establish that relationship with Him, because He's got a plan for you. And he wants to accomplish that plan in your life. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can uh, have the freedom to come into this house. And Lord, help us to realize who you are. And Lord, if there's people in here that you are calling, that you're putting something on them, or Lord, you're just calling them for the first time, to repent and to come back to you, Lord, I just pray that they will make that decision. Lord, I pray that they will do business with you, that they will repent of your sin and they will believe in your son that came and died and rose again to justify their sin and to be rose on the third day to save all of us from our sin. Lord, I pray that they will do that and believe and not perish. Lord, I just pray that for each and every person in here. And Lord, we just pray that you will move and work in the ones that you are calling, that you're nudging to do something. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe in him. Trust in him. Moses had to trust in him. We know, a lot of us know the whole story about Moses. And he trusted in him, had ups and downs through the whole time that Moses and God were running together. And uh, trust him. Put him to the test. Allow him to work in your life. Choose Jesus. And he'll change everything. His presence in your life will change everything. Put him to the test. Trust him. Follow him. James, would you mind closing?